The Book of Recollections, Episode 10, High Stakes, by Dai Sylvania. I am the Book of Recollections, and this is your Veeam Recap. Straight to the point, seeing impaled heads gives you a sense of urgency, you know. You have no idea what I'm talking about? Haven't you paid attention? Go and listen to the previous recaps, then come back. I'll wait. Uh, oh, back? Uh, good. Let's get to it then. A gentle breeze swayed the impaled heads, and as they hit one another, their mouths opened to utter one word. Head. Intrigued by the horrendous display, Castile took ten minutes to study the nature of the grotesque ornaments, his investigation aided by his familiar. The pikes were magical and carried with them the essence of Venoris. Thinking that the heads were offerings to the old lady, Castiel sat down and, to the disgust of everyone around him, began to fashion a head using flesh and a few drops of his own blood. Our protagonists were either shook or nauseous. A debate on morals and ethics sparked instantly. However, their attention was swiftly caught by the presence of an old woman standing behind the small wooden fence that led to the shack. She greeted them and asked if they wished to guard her mares for one night, stipulating that they must be back at first light, and if any of the horses are either missing or not fed enough, one of their heads would join the others on the pikes. One night might not seem much, but here, in the witch's domain, it meant one ear. Evander stepped forward, offering his head as tribute if anything were to happen, but, seeing how the Thorns and Thrones trials revolved around him, Castiel stopped the prince and took the consequences upon himself. After questioning the old woman and gaining some information regarding both their task and the reward, she beckoned them inside and offered them a lavish meal cooked by herself. Castiel tried to purify the food but was stopped by Jen and Grace who began eating. Although the journey had left everyone hungry, Castiel, Leo and Evander refused the hospitality of the woman. Understanding that the old woman's domain was guarded by Venoris, a common way of honoring her was actually through fasting. Light began to give way to darkness, and the group and the animals left the shack of the woman and ventured deeper into the woods. To make sure that the mares would be secured, Castile tied the horses together using a fleshy appendix found in his leather coat. After walking through the forest for a while, before reaching a meadow, they saw a nightingale following them. Exhausted, the group tied the horses to a wooden stump which would not impede the moonlight from shining down upon the horses. As soon as Grace and Genevieve sat down on the ground, they fell asleep. That instantaneous burst of exhaustion caused Leo, Evander and Castile to think back upon the food offered by the old woman. Their discussion was cut short by a slight vibration of the ground and the sound of massive footsteps. A troll made its way from the woods, dragging behind him the body of a wolf. The shambling behemoth came towards them. The group tensed, but seemingly unaware of their presence, the troll took a sharp turn and continued his way through the forest. This sudden rise and fall in adrenaline took a toll on Evander and Leo's body, who also fell asleep, leaving Castiel as the last man standing. He tried to wake up his group to no avail. Out of desperation, he took out another fleshy appendix from his coat, fashioning it into a noose and wrapping it around his neck so that, if he were to fall asleep, 
the sudden pressure would wake him up. Ah, just like that individual. Um, what was it? Um, Prince Charming from the old folk tales? Oh, only that guy used uh, sharp sticks. <laughs> Talk about a weird kink that would make even Martha's blush. Weary and tired, the man could no longer fight the urge to sleep, and not even the pressure of the noose was enough to keep him awake. So he dreamt, and in his dream he felt the lack of air, and he struggled. Right before passing the threshold into oblivion, he heard a buzz. A tiny mosquito appeared out of nowhere, and perching itself upon his flesh, it bit him so hard that he woke up. The king of mosquito repaid the man who merely a day before was kind enough to feed him. Castiel opened his eyes and saw in the distance a creature with purple eyes and deer antlers staring at him, but after coming to his senses, the creature was no longer there. All that was left was the cackle of a hag piercing the silence of the night. As a final means of waking his friends, Castiel manifested a blood ray by cutting himself. The group was startled back to their senses, and upon seeing Castiel hanging from the tree and experiencing the visceral rain, they thought they were dead. After making sense of the strange tableau, they realized that the horses escaped and ran amok. The group decided that the best way they could have a chance of catching them was to spread out. Grace managed to entangle most of them through magic. The mare, Leo chased, perceived it as a game and began to neigh mischievously, jumping around like a rabbit. The joyful mare was finally caught and after letting them feed a bit more, the group made their way back to the woman's shack. At the break of dawn, they found her sitting on the front porch, hunched over, her hands around her waist. As the horses approached the house, the group saw that they were pregnant. The nightingale perched itself upon Genevieve's shoulder, and talking to it, the dampier was amazed to see that it understood her. With their task done, Castiel was taken into the stables where he saw 14 horses of different shapes, sizes and colors. Two of the horses caught his attention, a sickly horse whose eyes were hepatically yellow and one whose shoulders seemed weirdly shaped. Castiel remembered a conversation from two days back about the fact that some horses had multiple hearts. so. After conjuring a worm which inserted itself into their nostrils, he found out that the hepatic horse had seven, whilst the one with strange shoulders had three. Although he wanted to take the sickly one, something told him that a better option would be the other one, although he was unsure why. Outside of the stables, the woman asked our protagonists if they wanted to spend another night and be rewarded one more horse, but with the clock ticking, they refused. Before making their way back, Castile asked the old lady if there was a way to speed up the growth of his horse. Interestingly enough, at the same time, Genevieve was taken to the kitchen after asking the nightingale the exact same question, and the bird showed her the stove that harbored freshly baked bread and smoldering coals. She thought that bread was the means of unlocking the horse's true potential, but after returning to the group, she found Castiel feeding his horse from a bucket of red-hot embers. After taking its fill, the horse backflipped and turned itself into a purple adult pegasus. Weirdly enough, purple was Castiel's favorite color. Everyone was amazed by what they saw and after being asked what his horse's name would be, he christened her Humanus. Satisfied with their reward, the group began to make their way back home. 
only the nightingale stayed behind, revealing to everyone that she was, in fact, a 15-year-old girl with brown hair. She introduced herself as Nightingale. A little further down the road, the group decided to take a rest, Genevieve offering to take the first watch. Halfway through it, she saw movement behind one of the trees and found Prince Finian, the older child of the queen, spying on them. He tried to buy Genevieve's loyalty, offering her treasures beyond count and even told her that she would be queen, but she wouldn't budge. With every advance of the prince, she tried to scare him, but her tactics backfired and made him more interested in her. Seeing how he could not buy her, at least for now, he handed Jen a pouch full of coins and told her that the offer was still standing. Then he left. Back at the campsite, Genevieve counted the coins and, to her disgust, there were a meager ten solis inside the pouch. With their energies recharged, the group headed towards Greenspring. Along the way, they started making an action plan for the first trial, but they were stopped dead in their tracks by the appearance of a familiar individual who had a snide attitude and somewhat slimmer body, three-fingered hands, and a weirdly shaped mouth. It was Shaq. This was the recap for episode 10 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Count Bear, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, Vim, the tale of immortality. Tune in Sundays at 5 UTC on youtube.com slash at Dysylvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us, and remember, every subscribe keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampire bite!